face inside and took him downstairs. As I neared the bottom of the steps, I was met by a man who very unkindly treated me. Seeing a man with hands raised, he came up to the blind side and struck me in the jaw, after which I was questioned and my money taken. The worst thing of all was being humiliated before little boys between the ages of 12 and 16 years, knowing these youngsters would grow up to try the same thing when they matured that others tried, but with less success, I am hoping. J.C. Latimer. One of the classic photos that comes from the, the riot is that of a perhaps 15, 16 year old, uh, probably would be referred to in those days as a hooligan, uh, strutting proudly in front of the camera with the burning and, and terrible circumstances in the background, uh, puffing a cigar, carrying not one but two firearms. As you look at that picture and you think of what's going on around him, uh, you, you can't help but hope that uh, uh, he, he will be taught a lesson about life's justice. The certainty that many blacks had that whites took their furniture, took their clothes, took various other personal possessions and, uh, and used them. And then having taken those things for their use, then they burned and bombed uh, the, the black part of town. It was a surprise. And they came over here and burned our homes, stole our clothes. Some of our people had to take their own clothes over white people right here in Tulsa. The heavy air was soaked with the scent of honeysuckle, as extravagant and lavishly unreal as was the gunfire. We've been in this prairie country a year. It proved always surprising. An acrid underhand of burnt powder began to cut through the perfume of the flowers. Tulsa's newspapers described the event as a military adventure. The black people defending their homes were described as the enemy. Gun-toting white men were referred to as riflemen or soldiers, and blacks were termed snipers. The mob, it was called a volunteer army. Blacks with guns were called a mob. Marauding whites were called patrols. At approximately 9.15 a.m., the National Guard troops from Oklahoma City arrived by train. In all my experience, I've never witnessed such a scene. 25,000 whites armed to the teeth were ranging through the city in utter and ruthless defiance of every concept of law and righteousness. Motor cars bristling with guns swept through the city, their occupants firing at will. General Charles Barrett. Fanny was our laundress. She lived in Greenwood, with an ancient uncle who had been the messenger in a bank for 20 years. They knew there was trouble, of course, but the mob had missed them so far. Uncle Zach had never been late to the bank, and he trusted white folks. He thought maybe if he put on his uniform and they saw it, he put it on and started out to work. Someone shot him at the corner. Fanny could see him lying there. She didn't dare go out and get him. Mom was so close. As North Tulsa burned and its citizens murdered and arrested, the guard set up camp and began to prepare a breakfast. When a local citizen urged the commander to take some action to save property and lives, he was arrested. Martial law was declared at 11.29 a.m. The Ku Klux Klan, realizing that they were now up against an organized military force, uh, withdrew out of the area and dissipated back into their neighborhoods. It was very much like a guerrilla operation where you could no longer tell who were the combatants because they weren't wearing uniforms and now they were part of the civilian society. Detention areas were set up at a local park, the convention center, and the baseball park. Every African American had to fill out and carry an identification card, which had to be signed by a white employer and approved by a local official. If approved, the prisoner was given a ribbon that he or she had to wear. The ribbon read, Police Protection. 
Failure to wear the ribbon resulted in immediate arrest and confinement. A black person could only be released from detention if he or she was vouched for by a white person. About 11 o'clock, they took my invalid mother, supposedly, to the convention halls for safety. Upon entering the convention hall, I failed to find my mother, so I went in search of her. I found my mother at North Methodist Church. I tried to get a pass to send her away, but failed to get one. She remained unconscious for two weeks and passed away. I feel that this damnable affair has ruined us all. Carrie Kinlaw. We hadn't heard from my father. And although I was six years old, I remember quite well the anxiety that all of us felt. Where's my daddy? Where's my husband, mother would say, and, and so forth. And so we, 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 had a, we had a period of agonizing waiting. And that was an awful, awful experience. And it was several days, I don't know how many, in the absence of, uh, of telephones and radios and that sort of thing, we didn't know. We had no way of finding out. And so after what seemed to have been an endless period of time, we received a letter from my father saying that he was all right. He, was, he told us that he had been in detention at Convention Hall and that, uh, and that he had nothing except what he had on his back. Prisoners, mostly women and children and the elderly, were marched through the streets with their hands above their heads. The stress, heat, and exertion resulted in the rise of premature births. Before the day was over, every black person in the city was killed, wounded, arrested, or placed in confinement. class whites actually hid many of the African-American domestics who worked for them at great jeopardy to them. If a white family during that riot had been found to have hidden an African-American, at the very least the white family would have been lashed. Terrified black people fled the city to other communities. After reaching this home, the crowd thrown there was too large to supply them out of a pail, so a wash tub was drafted in the service and pride cast to the wind. We were so famished and our lips parched, the children crying for a drink, that this was the best tasting water we could remember of having tasted. Mary Parrish. We had an engineer for the Frisco live behind us, and he would give us a day by day how these people were walking down the railroad coming toward Claremore, then coming toward Chelsea, then coming toward Benita. They were just like the rest of the hobos that came to our back door. And they had lots of them with baby buggies, no men at all. All women, lots of old women. On and on we went toward the section line, the crowd growing larger and larger. The question on every lip when a newcomer from town would arrive was, how far had they burned when you left town? After we had gone several miles, we began to see automobile loads of men with guns going east ahead of us. We wondered where they were going, 
but we were not destined to wander for long, for as we neared the aviation fields, we saw their destination. The planes were out of the sheds, all in readiness for flying, and these men with high-powered rifles were getting into them. As we went 